My name is Michelle Finn and I'm a spiritual daughter of God's Family Life Church. I am single, never been married, and I have a very handsome son which the Lord has blessed me with. I'm the eldest of four children. There's three girls and one boy. I grew up in a strict Christian home with both parents being born again, which meant that I grew up in church. I served in the different churches where we fellowshiped since the time that I was in high school. My dad never hit us, but commanded respect in whatever he said. It wasn't what he said, but how he said it. He spoke once and we listened. Somewhere along the line, my dad backslid and battled with alcohol abuse. We were evicted a lot of times because he used the rent money to buy alcohol. So I can't remember what the word was that was shared. Like I said, it was a preacher on television at the time. All I remember is that it convicted me to a point where I felt that I needed Christ and the life that I was living wasn't pleasing to him. I remember, as I said in the testimony, I remember kneeling down, praying. I cried as well, that's how convicted I was. Um, Yes, I was still growing up in church and I knew what it was to be in church, but their personal relationship with Jesus wasn't there. And that was the turning point for me. I loved being in the house of the Lord. By that time, my dad had rededicated his life to Christ and all was well. My dad passed away in 2015 and my mom is still alive. I think they had a good relationship growing up, but obviously when you're in a relationship, there's that level of trust and honesty that also needs to be there. Growing up in a strict home meant that there was never ever any open communication. So we didn't talk about relationships and sex. And I met my second boyfriend when I was in Standard 9. He lived in Amtata and was visiting family at, uh, in Peter Maritzburg at the time. And you know, as teenagers, we don't ever listen to adults. I was warned about him, but continued to see him. I matriculated in 1993, and then we went to the Trans Sky for a youth conference in March 1994. That's when I visited my boyfriend and fell pregnant, not knowing what I was doing. Uncle Joe and Auntie Daphne were people in AFM church, and um, they were like my spiritual parents, so to speak, at the time. And I was so scared, guys, that when they came home, I knew why they had come home. I disappeared into the kitchen to make them coffee, you know, trying to delay the whole process. And then I remember we were staying in Magnolia Road at that time, yeah, in Woodlands, and Auntie Daphne called me and she explained that I've got something to tell my parents. And then I told them, Mom, Dad, I'm pregnant. And it was a bit awkward for a moment because everything was quiet. It's like nobody knew what to say. But eventually, um, Uncle Joe and Auntie Daphne prayed over the situation. Um, I think for a couple of months, even the atmosphere in the home was a bit difficult because both my parents were disappointed at the time. But eventually the, that atmosphere lifted and everything was okay. I didn't know until a couple of years later that my mother was so disappointed at the time um, that she told me that she wants to kick me in my stomach. So I think that the news was so shocking that was just her way of dealing with it. So obviously I couldn't go back to full-time studying. So in 95, I stayed at home, um, did the housework, saw to Jesse, and then I would attend evening classes. Then because there was this additional financial burden, my father couldn't afford for me to continue studying. So I started working in 96, 97, I think it was. And that's how I was able to bring a little bit of money into the house. But yes, my parents helped us to a great, a great ordeal in terms of the finances. And also, um, because Jesse's dad didn't play a prominent role in his life, my father was that father figure for him. Whatever happens in the physical happens, or whatever happens in the natural happens in the spiritual. So for instance, if I'm walking outside and I fall, I'm not gonna stay on the ground and 
stay there for years. I'm going to get up immediately and I'm going to dust myself off and I'm going to keep on going. And that's the same thing in the spiritual. When we fall, we need to get up, dust ourselves off, repent. That's the main thing. And just keep on going on. And yes, there will be the naysayers. There will be those people that look at us in negativity. Oh, you did this, you did that. But like David, the important thing is to repent, to come back. And God is more than faithful and he will forgive you. I see myself as a lady that has been through a lot of challenges and I've overcome them. And... I've only been able to overcome them because of Christ in my corner. Well, uh, good day to you again and thank you very much for tuning in to Channel of Hope, more specifically into our program called Engage. Uh, you've just heard a powerful testimony uh, from a young lady, Michelle Finn, who was vulnerable enough to share her joint journey where at the peak of her joy of loving Jesus, she made a bad decision, fell into sin. And thank you, Michelle, for that powerful story. To unpack that a little further, I have two people in the studio today who, been, who have been with me as a shepherd for a long time. I can really say they're a son and a daughter of the house. Yeah, at God's family, but more importantly, they love Jesus. And uh, I'm going to ask them just to introduce themselves at this time, and uh, then we'll go into our short discussion. My name is Daryl Daryl Simons. And who's this wonderful lady next to you? And this is my wife, Sheila Simons. Sheila, you want to say hello so they can hear you? Hi, I'm Sheila Simons, and this is my wonderful husband, <laughs> Daryl Simons. <laughs> Well, thank you guys, and thank you for tuning into the program today. Now, um, let me start with you, Sheila. This is, this is a sensitive subject. A lot of Christians don't ever want to talk about failure. In actual fact, I believe we're at a place in the Christian walk today where people don't see the gospel as relevant because we present ourselves as being too perfect as children of God. And those who are non-believers, they, they feel that Christianity is out of their reach. Uh, that's why they look at us as hypocrites, and somebody said to me the other day, there's landmines outside the church before we even come into it, Pastor. So when you guys had your, your mishap, you want to just maybe share briefly what that was. And then just what were some of the feelings that you experienced when that stuff went wrong in your life? Let's start with you, Sheila. Um, when I fell, I was very much involved in church. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing everything that I basically love and I enjoy and I didn't see that the devil was tripping up on me. I didn't see the things that he was planning for me because I was also so focused on just being um, a good church member, a good wife, a good mother and doing everything at the best of my ability to actually please God at that time. Yes. And I was really enjoying, I can say I was at the peak of my walk mm. when the devil came and he pulled a rug under my feet. I really didn't expect it yes. and it happened and it was a terrible thing. Um, I wouldn't wish anybody to fall, you know, yes. the way I fell. I don't wish it on anybody and I wish nobody should fall the way I fell. Mm. But um, in God there's grace and yeah. there's forgiveness. Yes. And for me it was a very long walk um, to actually accepting the fact that I'm a fallen being and I've done something I never thought in my mind to ever do. Yeah. Um, it was very difficult firstly to forgive myself. You know, I, I, I struggled for months and months to forgive myself and also to get forgiveness from my family, from my husband, from my kids. It was very hard. But also I had the hope in God because I never let go of God. In that, I felt he was the only one I actually could hold on to because I depended mm -hmm. on him. Uh, with everything that was going on around me, I still stayed focused on Jesus and his love for me as a daughter. Wow. Yeah. You know, that's very powerful, the fact that in your, in your lowest moment, you still did not abandon God. Yes. Uh, you know, as a shepherd, we constantly counsel people, and we see when people fall, the first thing they do is run away from God. So that God had put that grace upon your heart yes. to stay connected to Him. Definitely. Daryl, how did you feel? You know, now that you know there was a violation of the marriage covenant, and 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 you know, just what was going on inside of you as a person 
when all this was happening? For me, uh, Pastor, it was, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you know what happens is it, that type of situation for a man's point of view, I'll just be a little bit uh, specific and real. You know, it's easy for us guys to go out and and do funny stuff. Yes. And and we expect our wives or our girlfriends to be forgiving. To be forgiving. Yes. But it takes a it takes an added grace mm -hmm. when it actually comes back the other way around yes. to bite you. Mm -hmm. It's more like giving a punch and being able to re to take a punch. Yes. But um, for me, it was hard. It, uh, I was in another valley, uh, but we, I was always conscious of God at that time. And mm. um, we've got our restoration. It didn't for me. It didn't. It didn't take long, yes. because as as my wife says, you know, we had to tap into our source. Mm. We were back up in a corner, mm. and we love each other. Yes. Regardless of whatever happened, we yes. loved each other. We love our kids, we love our grandson, and we had to we had to keep the radical middle together and stay focused. Yes, on the primary and where we want to go to. Right. And mean even me myself, I'm not a good person myself. I was never good myself. I also fallen in that regard. Yes. But you know. With God's grace, God's grace, a lot of, uh, I find a lot of uh, families, a lot of marriages have succumbed to this. Yes. You see, and, but by God's grace and his leading, he, mm. he, he even gave me the capacity to even forgive those that wronged me. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, in, as I said earlier, on getting our healing and restoration, it didn't have to take long because we were still in tune with God. Yes. God is always with us. God is with us even when we answer. Yes. He's there. Yes. But he doesn't like, I like what you always say, Pastor. God is with us during the sin, but he doesn't like the sin. Like yes. how he, he looked away from his son on the cross. Yes. He looked away because he didn't like the sin that his son had to carry upon himself. Right. So I'm reminded of that, that even in my uh, scrapyard experience that I also shared a, with the guys at the camp, yes. God came through to me mm -hmm. and he showed me things. So even in your broken situation or whatever you might be in, God can take that brokenness and he can turn it, he can remold it and he can put life back into it. And yeah. that's where we are now. We, we're not where we used to be. Yes. We are in a much better place and our union with each other is even stronger. Yes. Our love for each other is even stronger. That's our excellent. love for our kids is even stronger. Yes. A lot of other uh, family members, I mean, uh, people that also went to church with us, some of them have been divorced. Mm. It's also where you come from. Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm also ha very happy with when uh, Pastor Knowles and you mentioned that when you transition from one church to another, mm. make sure that you leave the soil behind. Yes, yes. Come with the, the plant itself. Mm. And get regrounded. Yes. Get the necessary help and be transparent. Mm. Don't come with your hojos and then afterwards you want the people to fix something that they don't know about. Right. So right. you come and you transfer those spirits into other people. Right. And then you then it's havoc and then there's a lot of repairing to do. Yes. So yeah, yeah, I like what you're saying, Daryl, because it, it aligns with the scripture. And uh, first of all, let me say I appreciate your 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 your, your truthfulness in the sense that you yourself had fallen in this area. Because yes. sometimes we can highlight, you know, when when it when it happens to a woman, and we we feel it's more acceptable when a man does it. Mm -hmm. But in the context of the kingdom, sin is sin, whether mm -hmm. a male male does it or a woman does it. In the eyes of God, sin is sin. And what I love that both of you, in, even in this fallen state at that moment, uh, you know, this, this scripture in Jeremiah 3. And for those of you that just join us, we're talking about uh, coming back when one has fallen. We're talking about um, being restored in the kingdom, how believers, when they fall, 
they they turn away completely from God as opposed to recognizing that they are backslider and God loves them. And just like the prodigal father was waiting for the son, mm -hmm. so God is constantly waiting for us. In actual fact, many said that the, the story of the prodigal son should not be called the prodigal son. Yeah. It should be called the parable of the loving father. Mm -hmm. Because the loving father was waiting for his son to come back. And yeah, uh, in Jeremiah, Jeremiah writes these powerful verses, uh, uh, Sheila and Daryl, in, in Jeremiah 3.14, Turn, O backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you, and I will take you, one from a city, two of a family, and I'll bring you into Zion. Jeremiah is talking about the nation of Israel being in a fallen state, but God is saying, I'm married to you. I'm not going to give up on you because in the eyes of God, a covenant is binding. Mm -hmm. It's forever and ever. So, Sheila, let's just go back to you a little bit. The attitude of the believer to you when you were in that state. How did you feel believers were relating to you? It's a bit... Um conflicting because yeah. there were those that uh, related there yeah. were those that understood yeah. and those that could actually uh, counsel me in that area mm -hmm. and uh, not judge me mm -hmm. but there were those that were so hard and like almost like they wanted to stone me if I can put it that way because yes. this was like you sinned there were those that like completely dissed me or should I say just ignored me disconnected from, <laughs> disconnected from me completely yes. and um yeah didn't even like talk to me afterwards for a very 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 long time and even up to this very day there are still those friendships that that, that, that will never, never be restored. repaired yes yeah. they will never be restored mm. um but on the other hand being connected to the body of Christ, yeah. being in the house of God, regardless of everything that was surrounding us, it was very difficult to walk into the church into the church doors. It was mm -hmm. very difficult to sit or even to greet anybody because mm -hmm. you were like daggers are all over you. You mm -hmm. know that is just the reality of the story. Mm -hmm. But also sitting under God's word and really receiving a lot of support from you, Pastor, mm -hmm. a lot of love, and we honestly can say, and we always go back to this. You showed us love that we never ever thought you'll, you'll actually show us, even when we went away for a season. You never gave up on us. Mm -hmm. You called us, you checked up on us, you made mm -hmm. sure that we were okay. We, we left for a season, not because we wanted to, because we, we had to. Mm -hmm. But we knew that our roots were planted here, we knew this is where God has put us, and regardless of whatever, that time away just allowed us to see so much more um, in other in other fellowships, it taught us a lot about other believers. We were immensely judged mm. in some places that we went to. Mm. Um, but just knowing that Pastor Greg loved us and Pastor Greg checked up on us, for me it was always a comfort. And I knew that when we do return, it's mm. going to be very difficult. But I knew that we had your full support. And that mm. is something that we really appreciated as a father of the house, mm. that you never judge us. You never spoke to us with words of judgment even once. Mm. And we thank you for that. Well, that's only God's grace because shepherding is not easy because you're also human. Mm. But when you do it under God, he gives you the ability to love despite the circumstances. That'll for you because you were the you were the guy in the situation. And, you know, you had that scrapyard experience where you were angry with the, you know, with the other party involved. But God did something. Can, can you just summarize that for us? Just quickly in a couple of seconds what happened to you that turned your life around completely in that scrapyard uh, obviously some of you don't know but Daryl went to the scrapyard to, to buy something isn't it no it was actually Elo sugar okay um, I started the off crop there and then I just told our, my manager there that was there um, that I needed to go and air my brains out yes because they could see that there was something wrong with me yes so by the should i say by it is by the uh, leading of the holy spirit that i went to the scrapyard mm. that's just they call it the lay down okay. where they keep all the old broken motors and pipes and whatever right. i just sat in the same i found myself sitting in the middle of all that yes and a voice came to me and said you know what all these things that you see around me that's been thrown here mm. by men and and there's no value for them I can bring the, all these things back up to life. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that came to me was I was, I was, I was feeling remorseful towards the, and worried about the, the, sick, the, the, the second party. Mm -hmm. So I ended up getting the, the guy's number from somebody. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, 
I had a prompting to phone him. Yes. And in that same, at that specific time and point of my phone call and connecting with him, that's when I, I wasn't much worried about uh, how he would uh, adhere to whatever I wanted to say to him. Mm. It was me uh, telling him that, hey, you know what, I forgive you. And this is where I am. And this is what, how, what God is showing me. Mm. that I need to release you. And me uh, releasing him, little did I know that I was getting my healing mm. at that exact point in the scrapyard. That's and I saw things from a different light. I could come back to my wife and share exactly what happened to me. Wow, you know, I'd love to have uh, you know, gone a little bit more because I believe this story, and, and I believe at some stage you need to write this, this story, could be really helpful to people but thank you for sharing your lives with us can you hold hands and we're just going to pray for people out there and just thank god that you know just like he's restored you if there's any marriage out there if you're out there and your marriage is going through a rough time or you personally are going through a rough time or family members are god is able father we thank you that restoration in the kingdom always is there it's available you said in your word, you'll restore what the caterpillar, the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust has eaten. Just like you've restored Daryl and Sheila. Lord, restore couples out there, families and individuals. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We started out with the 15 invaluable laws of growth. Law number one, the law of intentionality. Growth doesn't just happen. Law number two, we said, is the law of awareness. You've got to know yourself to grow yourself. Today, we tackle law number three, the law of the mirror. You must see value in yourself to add value to yourself. Powerful. I'm going to say that again. The law of the mirror, law number three. You've got to see value in yourself to add value to yourself. We started this leadership journey about potentiality. Potential is God's gift to us. Our gift to God is to maximize, is to develop, is to exploit fully that potential. The best way to do this is to know who you are. I go back to Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27. God, the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in the beginning speaking to himself, let us make man in our own image and likeness. Now, we don't all look like God, but the values, the principles, the nature God puts into first man. But because of Adam's sin, all of the human race entered into sin. Then the second Adam came, the last Adam, Jesus. And when we become born again Christians, his nature gets deposited into us. And that nature wants us to see ourselves in a very positive light. To know yourself so that you can grow yourself, to see value in yourself so that you can add value to yourself, you got to have a very positive self-image and self-esteem. What's the difference between the two? Self-image is the way others see you or the way you perceive others see you. Your physical features, your nature, your character. And then self-esteem is the value you attach to yourself. If you don't see yourself in a positive self-image perspective or you don't see yourself as very valuable, how are you going to exercise leadership and add value to others? What are some of the challenges that we face every day with the power of self-esteem? First and foremost, if we have a low self-esteem, a low self-image, we will not be able to add value to build up others and to give leadership because leadership, bottom line, is exerting an influence. So how do we build a positive self-image? You say, Pastor Greg, this is so elementary. I say, yes, it is. But many leaders are leading from a position of a low self-image or low self-esteem. And as a result, that they're transferring that which they feel into other people. First thing I think you need to do in order to build a positive self-image and a positive self-esteem is do not compare yourself to other people. That's so elementary, but so necessary. With Facebook, with Twitter, with uh, um, Instagram and all these social media platforms, the temptation to evaluate yourself with what you see on other people's Facebook pages or social media pages, you will be comparing yourself with the wrong person because sometimes that's not even a true reflection of who those people are. Stop comparing yourself with other people. Secondly, 
Do not embrace self-limiting beliefs. I'd like to read a quote for you by Charles Schwab. He says, when a man puts a limit on what he will do, he places a limit on what he can do. If you see yourself as small, just like the spies who went into the promised land, they said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. As a result of that, they shrunk. They became small. They were not able to understand this majestic, powerful God who gave them the promise in Egypt was about to take them into the promised land. The third thing is that add value to others. You know, this is so powerful. It's hard to feel bad about yourself when you are doing something good for someone else. That's why it's critical that we add value to others. The fourth thing that builds our self-image and self-esteem is do the right thing even if it's the hard thing to do. Oh, this one. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, it's been my challenge all my life long. Because sometimes when you stand for truth, when you stand on the values, the biblical principles of God, you end up with no friends. Because everybody wants to be loved by everybody and they're willing to compromise. You got to do the right thing, even if it's a hard thing to do. Then no guilt, no condemnation. Then you can be sure of who you are. Next, practice a small discipline daily in a specific area of your life. Discipline is one of the most powerful morale builders. So if you can practice a discipline, because there's an area in your life where you feel that you are not accomplishing what you need to or how you do need to do it in the way God has planned for you, just every day, small wins. If you practice small victories, if you practice small wins, you'll grow in your self-image and in your self-confidence. Once you practice a specific discipline, then celebrate the victory. For example, if you want to lose weight and you deciding that on this particular day, you're going to eat less than you usually do. When you walk away from that table, having eaten less, celebrate that. Small victories. If you cut down on your eating every day for a good season, you lose a lot of weight. That's one of the greatest challenges of the whole of the human race. Embrace a positive vision for your life based on what you value. Take all your values, place them in a basket, and pour them out for the future. Your values must drive your decision making. You know what? To have a positive self-image, to have a positive self-esteem, if it's based on values, you become consistent. You become permanent. You're somebody that people can rely on because what you say is the way you live. If it's values-based, it's not going to be feelings. Feelings come and go. They ebb and flow. But values remain consistent. Practice the one-word strategy. In other words, think of a word. If that word is not a good word, then don't say that word again. But if you think of a good word about yourself, a word that builds you up, the word that inspires you, use that word. Like, I'm an overcomer. I'm a go-getter. I'm able to make things happen. Whatever word it is, faith, hope, confidence, these words build your self-image. If you have a positive self-image, then when you are imparting into others, you'll impart positivity into them. This is the reason why many leaders are insecure, because they don't look at themselves the way God sees them. That's why the psalmist says in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, O God. Law number one, the law of intentionality. Growth doesn't just happen. You've got to be deliberate. Law number two, the law of awareness. You've got to know yourself to grow yourself. Law number three, the law of the mirror. You've got to see value in yourself to add value to yourself. If these principles are growing in you as a leader, definitely the influence you exert to others is positive. God bless you. See you again next week for value number four. Bye-bye.